Secondly, when the judicatories of a church do in their judicative capacity carry on a course of defection from the Lord and refuse to be reclaimed, it appears to me from the unerring rule of the word that these who desire to cleave to the Lord, though they are the smaller number, ought to discharge their duty by associating themselves together in order to display the banner of a judicial testimony for truth. Before I produce scripture pre uh, precept and warrant for this, I must premise the following things. First, when I speak of the duty of the minor part of the office bearers of the church to associate themselves together, as said is, it must be understood that they have access to meet together and are not hindered by outward violence or scattered by persecution, as is frequently the case of the church. Acts 8, verse 2. Secondly, I take it for granted that the keys of government and discipline are given to all the ministers of the gospel by the exalted head of the church, and that they belong to the pastoral office as well as the keys of doctrine as also that such as endeavor to be found faithful to the Lord have a better claim to the keys than such as are making use of them in direct opposition to the ends and purposes for which they were given to the office bearers of the Lord's house. And I think it would be no difficult matter to prove that such who are protesting the erroneous and who refuse to condemn error or to assert the truths in opposition to dangerous heresies vented and taught and who are tyrannizing over the flock and heritage of God, have forfeit their claim to the exercise of the keys till they return to their duty. And that this is the situation of the present judicatories of this national church may appear from what is said in our judicial testimony, and from our testimony emitted, 1734, and may be made more evident in due time. I hope you have such a view of the present state of matters that you will acknowledge that the keys are perverted and abused, that a course of backsliding is carried on, and that they refuse to return unto the Lord. And in this case, you and your brethren have the Lord's call to come out from among them, to associate together and to hold up a judicial testimony for truth, as, for instance, that command does oblige you to this, contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Jude, verse 3. And the truths of God are a sacred depositum and trust delivered unto the church. When they are opposed and assaulted, the members of the church are especially her, and especially her office bearers, who are particularly appointed and set for the defense of truth, ought to earnestly contend for the same. You know the import of the Greek word that it is not an ordinary contending, but a contending with the utmost ardor and fervency, a contending with all our might. It is a stretching of ourselves to the ut uttermost in contending for the faith, that is, in upholding, maintaining, and defending truth, in opposition to all attacks made upon it. You reckon that your dissents and judicatories are a contending for the faith. It is true that in some cases they may be a suitable and proper testimony to truth, but when the judicatories do, in their judicative capacity, carry on a course of defection and backsliding and will not be reclaimed, we do not stretch out ourselves to the utmost in the defense of truth, if we satisfy ourselves either with a doctrinal testimony or with a dissent in judicatories. It is evident when the office bearers of the church who desire to discharge their duty have access to associate and meet together to contend in a judicative capacity for truth, they carry a testimony somewhat further than by a simple dissent in judicatories. Though when we have done our utmost, we are far from doing that which is our duty, yet if we join not together to lift up a judicial testimony for oppressed and borne down truth, you do not contend earnestly, that is, you do not what is in the compass of your power to do, you do not what your pastoral office gives you a claim entitled to do, if the present judicatories in their judicative capacity contend earnestly to dismiss the erroneous from their bar and to oppress the heritage of God through the land. Shall not we contend earnestly, or shall not we display the banner of a judicial testimony in the name of the head of the king of Zion, for wounding and falling truth in our streets, and for his oppressed and grieved subjects, who have been lifting up a cry throughout all the corners of the land for many years by past, for help and relief, and who must needs groan under the yoke and burden without any remedy, notwithstanding of all your remonstrances and dissents and judicatories, unless you fall upon more effectual means for their relief? Likewise, we are commanded in Philippians 1, verse 27, to stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. The words striving together is most emphatic. The simple word signifies to strive as in a battle or in a race. 
The compound word used here signifies a joint striving. Like those who see the enemy advancing, they join together to oppose the enemy. This is the present state of matters in the judicatories in the Church of Scotland. They are bearing down the truth in a judicative capacity. They are scattering the sheep of the Lord's pasture. Ought not such as are aggrieved under these church ruining and renting courses strive together? Should they not join and associate together for the defense of the truth? You have a better claim to the exercise of the keys than they. The opposition that they make un unto the Lord's truths and people is an unlawful war. The power of drawing the spiritual sword is thereby devolved upon the better, though the smaller part. Ye ought therefore to associate together and assert the truths and do what lies within the compass of your power in a judicative capacity for the relief of the Lord's heritage and people. Otherwise I do not see that you comply with the command of standing fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. If this were sincerely aimed, with what courage and resolution that becomes them, by the Lord sent ministers in Scotland, as it would be most effectual check uh, unto a uh, it would be the most effectual check, excuse me, unto the, a corrupt party, so it would be a promising presage that our spiritual captivity should be returned, that our wilderness should become a fruitful field, and that glory should yet dwell in our land. I might enforce the present argument from other places of Scripture, such as Galatians 5, 1, Ephesians 4, verses 14, 15, 16, Colossians 2, verse 2, 2 John 8, Revelation 2, verse 25. But if I should illustrate and confirm the argument from these and other places of Scripture, I would swell this missive beyond all just bounds, and it is like to come out to a greater length than at first I intended. I doubt not, but you will allege that when you remon remonstrate in the present judicatories by your reasonings, votes, and protestations against the sinful and unwarrantable steps that are taken, that you strive together for the faith of the gospel. But allow me to suggest unto you, first, that your striving in judicatories is not a striving together. It is not a standing fast in one spirit and in one mind, while there is not a joint testimony given against the present course of defection. You are like broken and scattered parties who sometimes turn about and face the enemy, but the enemy possess the field. They have taken the standard from you. They have set up their ensigns for signs. Psalm 74, verse 4. Secondly, your dissents in judicatories are not a judicial testimony. They are indeed some testimony given in the court, but a judicial testimony for truth is an act of ecclesiastical power and authority exercised by the office bearers of the church when constitute in the name of the Lord Jesus, declaring and asserting the truths of Christ from his word, and vindicating the liberties wherewith he had made his people free, and condemning error and censuring the erroneous. We have an illustrious pattern and example of this in the synodical meeting at Jerusalem, Acts 15, where the rights and privileges of the members of the New Testament church are asserted and vindicated, and sentences passed against the Judaizing teachers, and they are condemned as such who trouble the disciples with words and subverting their souls. Verse 24. But when you dissent in judicatories, ye acknowledge that the keys are perverted, and that church power and authority is abused. And though your dissents and other means that you have used, uh, that you use, excuse me, have no influence upon the judicatories to reclaim them, yet you will not make use of the keys for the ends and purposes for which they are committed unto you. And thus, notwithstanding of all your dissents, Truth lies wounded and bleeding without a judicial testimony for it. The heritage of God are oppressed, and their rights and liberties are never judicially asserted and vindicated. And if thus your method and practice is followed, Christ shall not have an ecclesiastical court in Scotland to do justice to his injured truths and oppressed members in a judicial way, in this day of grieving, sinning, and backsliding. Thirdly, it deserves our serious consideration that the vinculum, or bond of our union in conjunction with the present judicatories of this national church, is broke. Hence, our union with them is dissolved. Therefore, we ought to come out from among them and to testify in a way of secession from them against the present course of defection. To illustrate and confirm the above argument and reason for bearing testimony in a way of secession from the present judicatories of this national church, we must inquire what is the bond of our union in conjunction in the said judicatories, and then it must be made appear that this vinculum, or bond is broken, that our union is thereby dissolved. And for the clearing the first of these, I shall offer the following things. First, 
When we speak of the bond of our union and conjunction in the judicatories, I hope it will not be alleged that the civil establishment granted unto any church is the vinculum, or bond of the union and conjunction of the office bearers of the church and ecclesiastical judicatories, or of such members amongst themselves. We will readily agree that the countenance of civil authority is not necessary to the being of the church, though it is very profitable and useful to her outward peaceable being as also that the countenance and protection of the civil magistrate given unto the judicatories of the church in the faithful discharge of their duty is a great outward blessing promised unto her in New Testament times, Isaiah 49, verse 23, and Isaiah 60, verses 5 and 10, as well as Revelation 8, excuse me, Revelation 17, verse 16. But when a course of backsliding from the Lord is carried on under the shadow of the civil establishment, and when a legal establishment is reckoned the bond of union and conjunction in judicatories, then, and in both these cases, it becomes a snare to the church, and is neither promised nor given by the Lord Jesus under her for, such, for any such ends and purposes. Secondly, the primary ligament and bond of our union and conjunction in all church judicatories is the word of God, or the profession, acknowledgement, and belief of the truth, as is contained in the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament, the only infallible and unerring rule of faith and practice, Isaiah 8, verses 20, Galatians 6, verse 16, 2 Peter 1, 19. And the secondary ligament or bond of any such union and conjunction are the subordinate standards of doctrine, worship, government, and discipline, which have been received and adopted by a church as agreeable to and founded upon the Holy Scriptures. Thirdly, the bond of our union and conjunction in the judicatories of this national church, immediately after the Lord brought us out of anti-Christian darkness, was our confession of faith, received and approved, anon 1650, together with the first and second books of discipline. The doctrine contained in the said confession of faith and the government and discipline of the Lord's house, as it is held forth from the word of God in the books of discipline, was frequently sworn to in the national covenant, which was renewed with great solemnity in the year 1638. Afterward, the Confession of Faith, compiled at Westminster, together with the form of church government and directory for worship agreed upon by the said assembly, were all received by the general assemblies of this church in the manner expressed in the several acts, adopting the same as principal parts of that conjunction and uniformity in religion, sworn unto in the solemn league and covenant of the three nations. Hence, the vinculum, or bond of our union and conjunction in all our church judicatories, is doctrine, worship, government, and discipline of our Lord's house, excuse me, is the doctrine, worship, discipline, and government of our Lord's house held forth from the Holy Scriptures in our Confession of Faith, Books of Discipline, Form of Presbyterial Church Government, and Directory for Worship, and all ranks of persons in this land are solemnly bound and obliged to abide in the faith, profession, and obedience of the said doctrine, worship, government, and discipline by the National Covenant of Scotland and by the Solemn League and Covenant of, th th of the Three Nations. But it is much to be regretted that the bond of our union and conjunction in the judicatories of this national church is broke, as will evidently appear if the following things are duly considered. First, though all ranks of persons have been guilty of the violation of our solemn oaths and covenants, and though they have been condemned by several parliamentary acts and deeds and treated in a most ignomi ignominious manner, excuse me, yet the judicatories of this church have never expressly asserted their perpetual and inviolable obligation since our wonderful deliverance from tyranny and slavery in that memorable year, 1688. If the obligation of our covenants had been recognized, or if the covenants, National and Solemn League, had been appointed to be signed by the office bearers of this church with accommodation to our circumstances, or if one had been made up of both with additions and explications suited to our present case, and with a solemn acknowledgment of the public breaches and engagement to the duties of the covenants, we had been nearer our reforming bond of union and conjunction in the judicatories than by the formula, 1711, not to mention that the general and loose formula agreed upon by the Assembly 1694, which, and no other, elders are required to sign to this very day. And here I may justly observe that, as these formulas are substitute in the room of our solemn national covenants, we have, in so far, deviate from our reforming bond of union and conjunction in judicatories.